to talk about the socio-technical path to high-performing teams. And um, I was doing slide shuffles right before we got started, which is why the, uh, the right picture for my observability engineering talk is not up there. Um, but uh, if you haven't seen it, it's got a cute little wolf on the cover. And, um, and I've also got a sheet of stickers so you can dress up the wolf in little like rainbow ears and stuff. So if you have the book and you want some, I'll, 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 I think I brought some with me. I'll give them to you. So I'm going to talk about uh, teams today. And I feel like, you know, we spend a lot. You see that? It's the contrast. It's a little dark. Mm. Well, nothing I can do about it now. <laughs> uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about our careers, you know, and how we're doing and our individual performance and all this stuff. And, um, you know, it's not like that stuff doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It matters a lot. But I think that we actually underestimate the, uh, the impact that choosing the right team, working on the right team, and growing with the right team actually has on our, on our careers. I really think of teams as being like these fundamental building blocks of um, ownership and um, excellence. Um, you know, and, and there's such a wide range of experiences. Like, I've never been on two teams that felt anything remotely like each other. Um, but they have some, you know, some commonalities. The way that they make you feel, just the, um, the experience, what, what it's like to be on them. Um, and, you know, I, I, right now I'm working on this, this like, sort of manager training um, thing at Honeycomb. And something that I keep circling back to is the fact that like um, a lot of places have had really crappy managers, absolutely. A lot of places have worked in really crappy teams. Um, and so we place a lot of emphasis on um, you know, inclusivity and kindness and, you know, and all this stuff. But all, and all those things are great. Um, but high-performing teams aren't just fun to be on. They actually, they, they perform. And that's part of what makes them amazing to be on, is that sense of fulfillment and growth and pushing your boundaries and like collectively achieving something greater than you could achieve on your own. But the question of like, how well does your team perform um, is kind of a loaded one. And it's something that, you know, it's something that, you know, we have this responsibility as leaders to ask ourselves, but it's also something that sounds pretty judgy. Um, so, like, when you're thinking about, like, how do I evaluate whether a team is high-performing or not? Do I want to join this team or not? I think, you know, the right place to start is always with the DORA metrics. Um, and they are, of course, how often do you deploy? How long does it take for your software to go live? How many of your deploys fail? How long does it take to recover from an outage? And I would add, actually add a fifth. Um, I think that every team needs to be tracking how often you get alerted outside of your work hours. And this is so so key right now, especially while you know we're we're in this kind of transitional phase. We're going from the world where, like, first of all, there was you know in the beginning, 50 years ago or whatever, there there were only engineers who wrote code and run that code in production, right? And then there became too much surface area, and so we split them up into like dev and ops, right? And now we're like, oops, that was a bad idea, so let's push them back together again, like dev ops, let's all play nicely together. And now I feel like we're kind of in this grand reunification phase where we're getting back to the the original vision of, you know, every engineer writes code, every engineer owns their code in production. And so we're trying to be, uh, we're trying, to, and the reason we're doing this is because that's the only way you can actually have high performing systems consistently is by, you know, understanding the code that you're writing. So I come from the op side of the house, right? And, and, um, I think it's no no surprise to anyone that we got a little too comfortable to like masochism. <laughs> you know, we get used to getting woken up in the middle of the night. Eh, it's fine, uh, and then you turn thirty and you're like, well, it's not really fine anymore. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, we need to raise the bar for ourselves, right? Because now we're inviting software engineers to join us, and we're like, come over here. The water's nice, right? But I feel like we really have a responsibility to relearn that sensitivity on behalf of others, because you know we don't want them to just feel like it was this big old bait and switch. Like, haha, you get to be miserable now too. Like, that's not that's that was never the goal. So, engineering managers, like, I, I feel like. Being paged inside work hours is a whole different beast from being paged outside work hours. When you're paged inside work hours, at least it's your job, right? And I am firmly of the school that believes that um, part of designing a good on-call rotation, you know, you should have 
at least at least five, more like six, seven people. Um, and I, I am a big fan of the philosophy where while you're on call, for the week that you're on call, you're not responsible for delivering product work. I think that's a super healthy thing. I think of it, think of it like you're, you're almost like a tithe, right? Like you're tithing or, or your 20% time that's invested into the system. You spend that time not, you know, trying to juggle between doing your product work and, you know, and on call. But like, no, you handle the on call stuff and it's also your opportunity to like, what is the stuff that's bothering you? Like, what are the rough edges on the deploy script? What are the things that have just been, like, nagging you? I feel like consistently investing this 20% time into the system over time makes it so that tech debt doesn't have, it's not just, like, constantly growing, becoming this avalanche because you're kind of, like, eating your vegetables on a weekly basis. Um, but TLDR, <laughs> I'm kind of rambling, but... Uh, you can't. You can get away from daytime pages being super costly. You can't get away from nighttime pages being costly. They're incredibly costly. They will burn a team out faster than anything. And especially for our brand new, bright pink baby, you know, software engineers who are newly minted, newly minted pager carriers, we really have to be gentle. So, um, the door report. You know, it freaked me out that year when they didn't publish the door report, and I was like, Are we going to have to live without it? Um, but they're back publishing again. Thanks, Nathan Harvey. Um, but like, if you if you look at how they define lower performing teams, they called it elite teams. I think they've dropped that word, which is good because I, I really hate it. Um, the the gap between the teams that are you know high performing and the ones that are you know the bottom three quarters of us, um, it's really dramatic. You know, it's like the difference between deploying once every one to six months, and many times a day. And I want to stress that this is not a question of being, being a high-performing team or not is not the same as saying, <laughs> uh, how good are you at engineering? Like, it's a totally different question from how good are you at engineering. Um, in fact, uh, I'm not going to say there's zero correlation, but there's not a lot of correlation. Uh, some of the best engineers I, I know, it, it's actually kind of the reverse because you have to be a great engineer to work on super low performing teams because you spend all your time doing really hard stuff instead of just shipping product. Um, and if you look at it um, year over year, um, it's a little scary because <laughs> we see that um, some teams are getting better um, but most teams are actually losing ground. And then there's 2022, which is a, that's a whole different story. Um, and, and when I look at this, what I see is the fact that computers exist in a, in a constant state of entropy. <laughs> You're constantly losing ground every single day. Um, things are getting worse. This is not a surprise to any of you, right? You build a shiny new feature, you ship it, things are great, and then the users start coming, and then the bugs start piling up, right? Things are constantly getting worse, and the only way that you can hope to keep up is by periodically leapfrogging, right? Like making an investment or a migration or something that like deletes some code, that gets rid of some features, that um, you know takes a whole category of bugs off the table, etc. Again, I want to stress this is not a question of the best versus the rest of us. But also, I want to point out that we waste a lot of time. Like, a lot of time. I don't know if you've seen the Stripe developer report. Anyone? Oh, my god. You should totally look it up. If you just Google, like, Stripe developer report, uh, it's, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's fascinating. The headline is that we self-report that we waste 42% of our time. Just straight up. We spend it doing all the stuff that like, we have to do in order to get to the stuff that we want to do. Stuff like trying to figure out where the bug is and trying to reproduce things and, and, and uh, waiting on each other for pull, re pull requests, pull reviews, PRs. Um, and obviously, it really pays off to be on a high-performing team. Like, a lot. 208 times more frequent code deployments. Which is why... This is why you really want to be in a high-performing team, because um, what happens when you know, an engineer from the elite bubble, so-called, joins a team in you know, the bottom 50%? Like, I feel like in our heads, we feel like, oh my god, a great engineer joins us. We're going to get so much better. And 
actually, you know, your productivity tends to rise or fall to match that of the team that you're joining shortly after you join it. Um, because we chronically overestimate, it's called the fundamental attribution error, right, in the social sciences. We chronically overestimate our impact on results and we underestimate the impact of the system upon us. You're going to write and ship code at the speed that the socio-technical system around you allows you to write and ship code. If it takes, you know, the best engineer in the world, you know, two days to ship a diff, it's also going to take you two days to ship a diff, right? Which means, you know, if you've got these two kids straight out of school, which one's going to be the better engineer in two years? Well, it's going to be, it's going to be the one that got to learn the most, which means shipping the most. Um, so how do we build these high-performing teams? Um, just hire the best engineers. <laughs> um, it's actually the, the, the other way around. Um, you build great engineers. Great teams are built by, great engineers are built by great teams instead of great engineers building great teams. The way that you build a high performing team is um, hiring people who share your team's values. And this is, uh, values is not, that's stupid. But it's not a value-laden term. Um, people can have all kinds of different values, and they could all be valid. But you have to you have to be with people who like to work the way that you work within reason. You know, if you're someone who really thrives on you know fast and close to right is better than better than perfect, you probably don't work on a database, for example. Uh, you construct these socio-technical feedback loops. You add instrumentation and observability because if you can't see where you're going, you know, you're going to, you're going to drive off the road all kinds of places. Practicing observability-driven development and rinse and repeat. Um, the word socio-technical, uh, I learned it from Liz Fong Jones. It's one of my favorite ones. And it means, this is one of the reasons I love it so much, it means exactly what you think it means. You don't even have to look it up. Um, the socio-technical systems uh, are comprised of, you know, the software that you, that you write, the systems that it runs on, the tools that you use to enact change on the system, and the people. And this is, this is part of what I think is so fascinating because part of the socio-technical system is, like, your brains. Like, part of the system is in your head. Like, if you have the New York Times uh, tech, tech team and, you know, the Washington Post tech team running, you know, very similar you know, type of software you might think, but like you just swapped them overnight, the, <laughs> the system wouldn't function, right? Because so much of the system is in their heads. No matter how good you get at documentation, it's always going to be that way. Um, not only are high-performing teams, you know, going to make you better at your job, but uh, they definitely make for happier customers. Uh, I've never actually seen, is this true? I've never actually seen a, a company where customers were super happy and engineers were miserable, or where customers were miserable and engineers were super happy. They tend to kind of rise and fall together, right? Happy people um, don't absolutely necessarily make for happy customers, but it sure helps. Um, and if you're, if you're a leader of any sort, um, and this is not just for managers, right? Anyone. Well, it sounds kind of wishy-washy to be like, everyone's a leader, but certainly every, like for the first, you know, five to seven years, uh, your job as an engineer is to get better, is to become a senior engineer, right? That's your job. But after that, I think your number one job is, is to build a great team. And that's where I feel like the job of engineering leadership is to pay attention to these socio-technical feedback loops and tune them and optimize them. Feedback loops like, you know, the pull requests, Feedback, feedback loops like um, deploys are the big one, right? Um, anything that feed, feeds back into itself at the, at the heart of your software system. So what does a, what does a crappy, <laughs> I haven't even sworn once yet, I'm doing great. What does a crappy feedback loop look like? Well, it looks like this. Um, engineer merges a diff, time passes, unknown amount of time. Many other engineers merge their diffs too. Somebody eventually triggers a deploy, with several days worth of merges, the deploy fails, takes something down, pages the on-call person who goes, oh, what's going on over here? And starts doing git bisect, doing, you know, grepping through the source code, trying to figure out what's wrong. 
manually rolls it back um, and starts pulling in everybody who had a diff <laughs> went out to try and figure out what went wrong. Everybody's day is shot, some people have to stay late, and everybody starts complaining about how, about how crappy it is to be on call and own your code. Um, a good feedback loop, a much better feedback loop, would look like this. An uh, engineer merges the diff, which automatically kicks off CI CD and deploys. The deploy fails, notifies the engineer who just made a change, who then immediately sp spots the error because they know what they just shipped, adds some tests and instrumentation, and commits a fix and, you know, in just a few minutes. Um, and something that I want to really <laughs> vote for here is the idea that CICD means uh, continuous deployment, not continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is a weasel word. And I know why they used it, because 15 years ago, that was the best that we could do. We could be like, okay, we're ready to deploy at any given time. You know, given the tools that we had, the practices that we had, good enough. But I would go so far as to say that any CI CD run that, that, that finishes without failing your code to some, some environment with real users, some form of production, is a failed run. The only point of doing CI is, is to set the stage for continuous delivery. We know enough about production to know that if you didn't deploy it, you don't actually know if it's good or not, right? There is no God but prod. <laughs> yeah, I should put that on a t-shirt. Uh, or, or as this one says, test and prod or, or live a lie. You, you can think your code is good all day long. Until it's running in production, you don't actually know. Um, now, do we at Honeycomb automatically ship every single diff straight to customers? Of course not. We're not crazy. Um, what we do is uh, we have production um, where all of our customers traffic goes. We have instrumented production and our instrumentation goes to the dog food cluster. Um, we've also, and so when we're looking for information about our customers or about our code, we use dog food. Um, our instrumentation from the dog food cluster goes to the kibble cluster. And if we're looking for information about how dog food is doing, it goes to Kibble. Uh, so uh, our CI CD run um, deploys straight to Kibble, and then it waits an hour. Um, people are actively using Kibble for like you know design staging and, and other things, which I think that is the, that is the key, right? If if it's going someplace that only robots hit, then it's not production enough. But if it's going a place where real humans hit, that brings enough chaos to count. Um, so if Kibble is stage stable for an hour. And then it gets automatically promoted to dog food. And people are using dog food all day long. If dog food is stable for another hour, then it gets automatically promoted to production. Um, and at any point, if people just want to go whoop, halt, um, they can do that. But um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a life changer. Uh, knowing that your code is going to go out within a few minutes after you merge it, all of the crazy deploys about the debates about like Friday deploys, how late should you deploy, and all this stuff, uh, they're, they go away. They're meaningless when you shift the discussion to whether or not you're going to merge your diff. You can merge your diff anytime you want, as long as you're going to stick around long enough to watch it and make sure it's good and stable in production. So, like, you know, don't deploy at 5 p.m. on Monday and waltz out the door. Um, don't deploy on Friday if you plan on, you know, not being around. But any time, I mean, and the reason that I think this is a better policy than just being like, here are the rules, deploy here, don't, is because ultimately we're all in the job of, of developing engineering judgment, right? Rules are a way of like, taking judgment off the table and just being like, do, it, do this, do that. And I, I, I believe that the, def, the difference between a senior engineer and a not senior engineer is the quality of their judgment. And you have to like train that, <laughs> that corpus on. So I'm a big fan of judgment. I'm a big fan of automatic deployment. Um, but honestly, I, and, I, and I also will come down hard for like having it be a fairly short interval of time, but I actually think it's more important that it be a predictable amount of time than it be a very short amount of time because you really want to hook it into the body's own like autonomic response systems. You want to have this feeling in your body, oh, I've merged my code, something isn't right, I, I'm not done until I've gone and looked at it in production, looked at my instrumentation, you know, looked at my code through the lens of the instrumentation I just wrote and asked myself, is it doing what I expected? Does anything else look weird, right? That's when the loop has been closed. Whew, I could breathe, I could exhale, I could go like page that out to disk and pick up another project. Um, 
doing that right there is what I think of, of as observability-driven development. And it will catch the overwhelming majority of errors that you would otherwise have shipped out happily to production. The cost of finding and fixing those errors goes up exponentially from the moment that you write them, right? You type, you type an error, you backspace, great job, right? Uh, if you didn't find it there, you might find it when you're running tests. If you didn't find it there, your best chance is right after you've deployed it um, through your instrumentation. Um, and I really don't think that you can expect people to own their code if you're batching out a bunch of people's uh, code in, a bunch of diffs in, in, in like giant deploys at, ir at like irregular intervals. If, you're, if you've just merged something and you know your code's gonna be live within an hour, you're likely to go look at it. But if you merge it and you have no idea when it's gonna go out, but you're pretty sure it's gonna be yours and a bunch of other people's, you're never gonna go look at it. How can you hope to hold engineers responsible for looking at their code when you're just like, someday it'll be out there? Anyway. Uh, observability is also really key to this. You know, I think of it as you know, putting on your glasses before you go driving down the freeway. Um, you, Obviously, I'm a vendor and should take everything I say with a grain of salt, but the amount of time that teams will spend just flailing around if they can't see what they're doing um, is, is immense. Um, uh, tiny detour. Uh, observability you know, from control theory is how well you can understand the system with, you know, from the outside by just looking at it from the inside. Observability-driven development. Um, the virtuous uh, cycle gets kickstarted when you know when you instrument as you go. You never accept a PR unless you can explain how it's going to break, not if it's going to break, how it's going to break. Um, one of the things that we do at Honeycomb is we ask everybody to put in into their um, into their Git comments um, uh, uh, how how to understand this software in production. Like, how can I tell if this is working or not after it's been shipped? Watch your code go out as it deploys. Is it working as intended? Is anything else look weird? Um, I also think it's super important that people be looking at their code every time they deploy it because if you only look at your code when you know it's broken, you don't have that good gut feeling for what normal looks like, right? You don't really understand abnormal unless you have a good feeling for what normal looks like. Um, you have an observable system when your team can figure out new behavior with no prior knowledge. You, you have a monitorable system when you can look at dashboards and go, oh, this has happened before. Um, the test of an observable system is whether or not you can do the same for, for new problems. Um, why are computers hard? Well, <laughs> because we're constantly shipping code that we don't really understand uh, onto software that we've never really understood. And, and then we wonder why it's hard to understand. Well, we've never actually understood it. You know, we, we've been looking at it like it's a black box and just like, you know, what's in there? Let's ship it and wait for something to page us. That's the worst feeling in the world. No wonder nobody wants to be on the hook for carrying the pager. Um, and vendors have been really not helpful here because they, they promised the world. They're like, aha, I have this magical tool. You'll never have to understand your system because my tool will do AI and it will understand it for you. Never buy that tool. <laughs> you know, if something is promising to understand your code for you, it's a trap. Run away. At the end of the day, you have to understand your code. Nobody else will do it for you. Certainly not in AI. And I'm not anti-AI. We just shipped an AI thing that I think is dope as hell. Um, but it's all about helping humans understand. You know, computers can crunch numbers all day long and tell you whether there's a spike or a dip, but only a person can attach meaning to it and tell you whether it was good or bad or expected or not. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm actually so stoked about the coming uh, AI revolution because I feel like, bear with me for a second, <laughs> I feel like, We've, we've had this, this misconception that the hard part about software is writing it. You know, this, this, like we pay software engineers more than we pay operations engineers. We're like, oh, it's so hard to write software. It's not. It's not. It's hard to own software. It's hard to maintain it. It's hard to, it's hard to like, um, it's hard to change it. It's hard to modify it. It's hard to like own it over the long run. And now that the approximate cost of writing software is about to drop to like pennies, Everybody's going to know that the hard part about software is not generating code. 
code has always been easy to generate compared to uh, how easy it is to own. Um, I'm just gonna look up here now because this thing is giving me epilepsy. Um, here's the dirty little secret. Like, the next generation of systems is not going to be built by burned out people. They've gotten too hard. They've gotten too complex. It used to be that you could run on autopilot. You know, the, the, anyone here remember the bastard operator from Hell Comics? Yes, yes, super funny. Uh, also kind of true for a while. They're not anymore, uh, which is a good thing. I, I repent of my sins. Um, but we can't, we, we don't do that anymore, right? It really takes curiosity. If there's one thing that it takes to understand and, and run modern systems, it's curiosity, it's continuous, like learning, it's being comfortable with discomfort, it's, it's, it's not ever, it's not ever really knowing what, what you're doing, it's, um, and having that feel good. They become too complicated to just run on autopilot. You can't model, model the systems in your head and, and just jump to the solution. You can't just create a dashboard that will explain to you what happened last time and predict what happened next time. Um, our, our systems are increasingly emergent, unpredictable, um, and, and, um, and uh, if you don't invest in observability, um, you're gonna have a really hard time. Anyway, where are we going? Um, on-call needs to be shared by everyone who writes code. On-call can't be terrible, right? This is the, these are the two halves of the handshake, right? We, we democratize on-call, we make sure that everybody who's writing code is owning their systems, and in exchange, we have a moral responsibility to make sure it's not life-disrupting and awful, that it's not causing sleep disorders, that it's not causing people to lose out on weekends with their kids. You know, I feel like it's reasonable to expect an engineer who works on a highly available 24-7, you know, highly available system to be woken up two or three times a year. I think that's reasonable for everyone. Um, not two or three times a week. <laughs> but this means we have to raise the bar for ourselves when it comes to investing in our deploys and our instrumentation, investing in understanding our systems. We have coasted for so long not really understanding our systems, in part because we didn't really have the tools to do so. If you don't have high cardinality, you can't understand your systems. In part because we didn't really believe it was possible. You know, we've got this idea that, you know, oh, you have to be Google to work in one of these systems where you get to understand your software. And you don't. It is easier. You can be a way worse engineer and work on a high-performing team and get tons of stuff done because most of your effort is going towards, towards forward propulsion instead of just floundering around in the quicksand. Uh, yeah, I need to write a blog post about that. There is no regulation that says that uh, your software engineers cannot own their code in production. In conclusion, um, your labor is a scarce and precious resource. Um, don't stick around at bad jobs where they're not using it well. I feel like, I know the labor market's been like this, um, and a lot of people are freaked out right now about um, generative AI, but I for one believe that Understanding software is, is still going to be our jobs. We can't outsource that. I doubt we will within my lifetime. Understanding software is the job. Um, you can't expect a, an AI to do that for you. Um, I do worry about juniors entering the field. But uh, I think that we also have like a moral responsibility to ourselves to give our labor to those who are worthy of it. So I do think overall we, we have the tools uh, our culture has improved. We're a lot more self-aware as an industry now than we were um, when, I, when I joined. And I think we really have an opportunity now to make things better for ourselves. So let's do it.